Awesome. Well, good morning to you. Let's stand and let's join our voices together to give our God praise. this morning that declares that our God is worthy of our worship. That's why we gather here today, and it's great to see you here at Central. We want to take a minute right now, find somebody we haven't seen yet, a new face in the room, shake their hand, say good morning. It's going to be a great day. Well, good morning, and you may be seated. Yes. 
Thank you, Noah, for such enthusiasm. And welcome to Central Baptist Church. Family, we are so glad you are here. If you're visiting with us, in front of you is a green card or teal, as some people like to refer to. And you can fill that out, place that in the offering plate as that's passed later in the service. And again, if you're visiting with us today, you are family, and we are so glad you are here. You have a special treat today because Matt... Happy Flynn is preaching today. Yay! Yes. It'll take about 30 minutes to get up on stage, but we're so glad that he will be sharing with us because he has, he has a brand new knee, so be sure and pray for him. And uh, if he starts to fall, make sure he's okay, and then we can make fun and laugh. Amen? So again, we are so glad you're with us and glad that you are worshiping with us today. Now, Matt is preaching today because Pastor Brian and Miss Brenda are celebrating that brand new grandbaby again overseas. Look at that. Oh, oh, Caleb's in. Yeah, give a hand for that. That is awesome. That is so awesome. And also, speaking of little babies, we are starting our Pregnancy Resource Center Baby Drive. You can see the bulletin for information about that to just support those uh, mothers and their babies. And that is a great, great ministry to show that we care about the babies and, of course, the unborn babies. We want to make sure that we love them and those mothers. Also, just to let you know that we have baptisms next Sunday. Amen? Yes, yeah, celebrate that, what God does. Now, I said this to the first service. Let me say this to you also. Maybe you're in here and you have never taken those first steps of obedience by listening to what Christ said when he said, do like I do. And so this may trigger something in you, even when I said baptisms. So you can talk to one of the staff, even after the service. We'll be over in the connections room and talk about what does it mean to be baptized and just be obedient to what Christ said by following him in believer's baptism. Also, something very special today, I'm going to ask that Trey and Megan Dickey come join me down here at the front. Since I'm short, I'm going to let them stand down there. So they are our missionaries going to the Philippines. Isn't that exciting? And yes, amen. We're so excited when God's people and when family members from Central obey the calling God has placed on them. But before they can go to the Philippines, I was teasing them, they have to go to training. And look how excited their faces are when I said the word training. So we want them to be equipped and know what they're doing when they get over there. But we also know this, the Holy Spirit speaks to Trey and Megan as they go over. But they do have to go through some training. But we're going to commission them, send them out, pray for them. And we are so thankful they are going out doing the Lord's work. So if you know them or you feel led or you're going to be supporting them in prayer, and we're just going to ask you to come and pray for them. So come and join me as we lay hands on them and pray for these two wonderful people. Some of you have had some very, very important important work getting them ready and praying for them and we're going to continue to pray for the both of you <laughs> I won't share what's being shared up here so all right we love both of you so very much and we we're so thankful that you go as missionaries out from central and also for all of you out there when the Lord brings to mind Trey and Megan guess what he's doing that on purpose amen that means stop what you're doing, unless you're driving, eyes open, and lift them up to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Trey and Megan, and we love them so much. They're our family and will be our family. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have already prepared the way, and you promised that you will not leave them. And in Joshua, you said wherever they go, wherever, the, wherever their foot Steps You have already given it to them. Wow, thank you. We love them so much, but you love them so much more. And we thank you that angels are around them to protect them, to watch over them. And Father, we thank you so much that not only are they going to bless the people in the Philippines, but the people there are going to bless them so much. They are going to be partners with the Holy Spirit and with the believers in the Philippines to do great, great things. And yes, Lord, all joking aside, we pray for the training that it comes quickly, they learn it quickly, and they can get about doing the Lord's work. But I pray for the people in training that they will be blessed and the people they come across with will truly see the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. So, Father, take care of our kids. It's what you do best. Amen. 
We love you guys. Amen. Love you. Amen. Church, let's let Trey and Megan know how proud of them we are this morning. We serve a great God, and he's going to do awesome things in their life, but he's going to do great things here this morning as well. So let's stand in honor of our great God, and let's sing. Oh, Lord, my God. out of my pockets, you know? Makes me want to do something with them. But I'm Baptist, so I'm scared. <laughs> no, that's just what I'm seeing in you guys. I love you, church. Let's just worship our great God this morning. He's given us new life. Let's celebrate.
I will redeem them from death. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. He will swallow up death forever. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Greater love has no one than this. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible. The only God. The only God. The only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Anybody thankful this morning that the blood of Jesus is sufficient? Amen. Amen. He paid a debt he didn't know when we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. So we say thank you. Let's bow in prayer this morning. Father, we say thank you for your grace today, your mercy that is new. So we do our best to focus our attention on you. In the middle of the chaos of our lives, God, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because we have nothing if not for him. So we worship you today and we give you our praise and we say thank you. All in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Thanks for worshiping through song today. Go ahead and have a seat. Awesome. As we continue in a spirit of worship, um, I wanna encourage the ushers to come down and uh, as we prepare to take an offering. Um, as Christians, uh, we do not give um, out, out of the, we have too much, let's get rid of this. We give because God has given to us. And today, as, as we do that, as we, as, we, um, as we offer back to God, back to the church, uh, what he has given us, um, keep that in mind. Uh, let that challenge you. Let that encourage you. Let the balloons pop. And... Um, let it be good. Hey, when you give to Central, it, it, it goes in a lot of different directions to a lot of different ministries. Um, and one of those ministries is the Pregnancy Resource Center. And, and we get the chance um, to, um, to bless them um, through a percentage of our offering. Um, in a second after David prays, there's going to be a video that I want you guys to pay attention to. Um, not because it's something you haven't heard before, but it's because it is... Um, it is so important. It is, it is a thriving ministry um, in Owasso that, that, that needs our support and needs our prayer. So, um, so David's going to pray and then watch that video. Father, as we come today, we just want to Lord, say just thank you. God, all the great things you've done for us and have already put before us, Father. We just offer our praise. And there are those here this morning, Lord, that come seeking healing. There are those coming this morning. Lord, just, just looking for a friend. And Father, may you just embrace them in a way that they know you are there for them. And Father, those here also just to come to say thank you for, God, all that you've done for us. And we thank you for this privilege that we have to come to a place that's separated from the world that you desired your people to worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are God. We just seek your direction, Father, as a church. We lift up our search committee to you, Father, as they continue to seek the person out that you've chosen to be the shepherd of us here at Central Baptist Church. Lord, prepare our hearts to, Lord, just to receive, Lord, that individual and that family that you've already called in your time, in your place. That Father, we would have unity that only you can give us, Father, and peace, Lord. Not, it's, it's not about us, Lord. It's about reaching others for Christ. And, Lord, those going to the mission field, Father, we just lift, lift them up to you, Father. And those that are already there, just protect them and guide them. And, God, again, we just know nothing but to worship you on this, your day. And as we partake of your giving of you the offering, Lord. May, you know, we just also not just give of our monies, but also of our lives, Father, that you so desire that we would follow you, that, Father, we would reach the world for your kingdom. And again, Father, we just thank you for Matt and his preparation. Speak through him in a way that, 
Only you can. Lord, I just thank you for all the leadership of Central Baptist Church. And, you know, you brought us through a, a different a different kind of year, but, but God, uh, you are in control. You've done great things. And again, we're so excited for what you're about to do. Just again, Father, we just love you. Look forward to what you're going to do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Unplanned pregnancy is a frightening and overwhelming situation, regardless of your age, gender, or marital status. Some have the support of their family and friends during these emotional times, while others have no support at all, which is exactly why the Pregnancy Resource Center exists. I'm reminded of a story when a young couple came in for a pregnancy test. It was obvious their relationship was on the rocks. They quickly stated their plan was to get an abortion as they did not want to complicate their life any further. To be honest, we were surprised when they returned for their scheduled ultrasound. As they watched their baby's heart beating on the screen, the couple was surprised as we explained how their baby is fully alive, has all of its body parts, and can even feel pain. When the ultrasound was over, we handed dad the printed pictures and watched his eyes filled with tears when he read the words, hi, mom and dad, on the picture. It was at that moment that both parents committed to having this baby. Our prayer and goal is for every story to end like this one. But across the nation, nearly four out of 10 pregnancies result in abortion. Believe it or not, abortion is currently the number one killer of Americans. Each year, nearly one million precious lives are lost to abortion, which surpasses the number of lives lost to heart disease or cancer. For those facing unplanned pregnancy, abortion is often the first option considered. It seems like a quick and simple fix, when in actuality, it's far from it. The Pregnancy Resource Center makes a difference between life and death by providing a safe place to receive medical care and support for those facing unplanned pregnancies. No one should have to face this journey alone. At the PRC, we provide pregnancy testing, limited ultrasounds, and screening for sexually transmitted diseases at no cost to the client. Studies demonstrate that if a woman sees her unborn baby on an ultrasound, in nearly 90% of instances, she will choose life for her child rather than abortion. We also provide continued support by pairing both the mother and father with one of our mentors, where they learn about pregnancy, parenting, relationship skills, and overall life skills. They earn points at each meeting, which can be redeemed for much needed supplies, such as diapers, clothing, strollers, and even a new car seat. And if you are a parent, you know how challenging it can be to care for an infant, which is exactly why we continue to provide support even after the baby is born. The services we provide extend far beyond what can be seen or demonstrated in this life. The simple action of providing love that is free from judgment is the best gift we can possibly give another human being. Become a partner with the PRC today by volunteering, becoming a mentor, giving financially, and even lifting us up in prayer. When you partner with the PRC, you help make a difference between life and death. Right now, we're going to dismiss our kiddos to go off to Children's Church, ages four years old through kindergarten, can be dismissed right out those doors over there. And our first through fourth graders can be dismissed to go to Children's Church. If you don't read your bulletin and you still don't know what we're doing with Pregnancy Resource Center, there's baby bottles in the four years. Grab one, fill it up with change, money, checks gold, whatever you want to put in there, <laughs> bring it back. And uh, we'll support that awesome ministry. Parents, you can find those kids down in our kids wing, the younger groups halfway down the hall and the older groups all the way down and around the corner at what we call Kids Central in the big room. Glad that they're here and glad that you're here this morning at CBC. <laughs> Was that me sighing? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you uh, for your many prayers. Uh, many of you know, and some of you may not know, <clears throat> that I had total knee replacement on January 2nd. It was kind of a surprise, but you know, hey, why not start out the new year with new body parts, you know? <laughs> and so I, I say a surprise. I knew I had knee issues, um, 
and the, I didn't even see the doctor until December 23rd, so I figured my surgery would be like in March, but there was an opening on January 2nd, and so I kind of jumped on it. And so, uh, but I know many of you have been praying, and I appreciate that so, so much. So I really feel like a senior citizen now because I've got my cane, I've got uh, the compression hose on so I don't get blood clots, and i got all my pills lined up on the kitchen counter. So, you know, I'm, I'm ready for the senior adult life and to move in into that, and so I'm looking forward to it. It is an honor this morning to be up here to be able to bring you God's Word. Uh, you know, I, I really believe God laid this message on my heart way back in, in December, uh, and I was talking to the staff about, you know, encouraging and, and what could we do at the beginning of the year, having no idea that Brian was going to be gone. And, of course, then they had the baby there, and he took off. And so it really worked out in God's timing for, for this. And so I, I really feel like he laid this heart on my, uh, this message on my heart to share with you. It's not something so much about teaching you something brand new. Uh, but it's really just to kind of remind you, you know, you've seen a lot and read a lot uh, as you've been reading the newsletter that 2019 was a year of transformation in the sense of we were in transition or transition because we were trying to adjust to uh, being without a senior pastor and just a lot of different adjustments as we were making through there. But we're really looking forward to 2020 to be the year of expectation of what does God have planned for us in 2020 as we look forward. And, and I have no idea when the pastor search committee is going to be bringing a candidate before us. But, you know, the thing is, it really doesn't matter that I don't know. Uh, the pastor search committee may not even know right at this second. But you know who does know? God does. God knows in his timing that he is going to be able to bring that man and his family here to begin to lead us uh, because it, as, as important as that position is and he will be our under shepherd, we're well aware of reading the scripture that who is the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. And, and, and as we as a staff and with the senior pastor leading the staff and leading out of the church, we're humbling ourselves before God to reveal to us the direction that he have his take, he take. And we're praying that God will reveal to the body also the direction that we should take. So it's not one man leading us, but Christ is the head and the body following. But we can only follow if we're open and willing to be servants and followers of the one who has the plan, the agenda. Now, Ryland kind of asked me, he said, so what are you going to, I need a name for your sermon or a sermon title and, 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 a, and a scripture. And so you see up there, control freak, and, and that really comes from an email or something I got on, online that it says, are you a control freak? And I was reading through the th different things that are on there, and I'm going, well, wow, that's me. Wow, <laughs> that's me. You know, not that I really didn't know I was a control freak, but it really affirmed that I was a control freak. And so uh, I'm going to give you a little test here in a little bit. But today, what I, what I want to remind you of this is this, that um, all of us have a little bit of wanting to do our thing and, uh, and some of us are going over, over a little extreme over than others. But here we go. You might be a control freak if you are too focused on the future. What we tend to do there is we're always looking to these future events that life will begin after this. We'll convince ourselves that everything will be under control tomorrow. And even though our lives maybe seem out of control right now, what we do is, as a control freak, we'll say, well, tomorrow will be better. I'll get my ducks in a row. I'll get everything lined out, and it won't be as chaotic as today. You might be a control freak if you sometimes overreact. Like this morning, yeah, you know, I got in here, wait. Sometimes what we do is that we get on the scale, and we go, oh, no. Well, I got on the scale this morning, and I looked at Charlene, and I said, okay, that's it. No more little fishies, no more monsters, and cut everything I'm eating in half because I just gained a pound from yesterday to today. 
<laughs> and then she's telling me, well, it's probably the salt and the ham and all that. And you, you know, like, doesn't matter. You know, it's just I'm overreacting. And we tend to do that if we have these pre-planned schedules. And you know those of us who are like this, we have these schedules planned out there. Then all of a sudden something comes along and disrupts our schedule. And we're just kind of like this going, really? Really, God? Is this the time for this to happen? And it's messed up our schedule. You might be a control freak if you're, you, uh, if you're always playing this what-if game. You become obsessed with solving potential problems, always suspecting something will go wrong. These scenarios run through your head constantly of like, okay, I want to make sure I got this under control, so I better bring this, I better pack this, I'll do this, I'll do that in case. And, you know, and I'm a Boy Scout, and so the motto, be prepared. And so I'll go back to that. So I was just being prepared. Well, no, Matt, you're being a control freak because what you're doing is you're trying to solve problems that haven't even happened yet. You might be a control freak if your self-talk is negative. Do you ever find yourself beating yourself up? Now, I do to-do lists. I'm known for my to-do list. I make my to-do list. I put more items on it than I can accomplish in a day. And guess what happens at the end of the day when I don't have every box checked? I get down on myself. I said, well, I didn't finish it. Even though I know I put more items on there than I could do. And so, you know, also if you're trying to do a project and it doesn't come out the way you want it as a perfectionist, you get down on yourself and, you're, and you have this negative self-talk. Last one, you might be a control freak if you sometimes freak out when things don't go your way. You lose it. You, you have this emotional distress, and when you see something or sense something's not going your way, you just, you, there again, all these things begin to pile up. Now, you may not be a control freak to the level sometimes that I can be, but I can guarantee you that there's a little bit of control freak in you. And the reason I can say that is there's times that you have set your own agenda there's times that you have your plans, and you're going to go through with it, and nothing's going to stop you. And what I'm, I'm not saying here that you can't have plans, and I'm not saying here that you shouldn't set goals. What I'm saying here is, are we being self-centered when we're making our plans? Are we focusing on us only and not the outcome of living our life for God and being God-centered? So this is the hard part, convincing ourselves we're living a Christian life knowing we are not perfect, but convinced we're living in one world, but in reality we're bouncing between these two worlds of self-centeredness and God-centeredness. Because what we'll do is we'll, we'll come to church and we'll, we'll participate and we'll serve and we'll do these things here and then come Monday or Tuesday, we're off doing our own thing. And really, as we're making plans and, and doing things, we're not considering what is God's agenda, what's God's purpose. So how do you stop living in these two worlds? How do you stop justifying your opinion, the actions you're going to take, versus living in the world where we trust God? We're living in the world where we have faith in God, living in a world where there's no hesitancy in our obedience to God. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said this, No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, in, that, in this particular verse, Jesus is speaking about you can't be in love with money and serving money and then also serve God. You serve one or the other. But just fill in the blank. Take money out. What are the other things that we put in its place that become a pri priority or an idol in our lives? We're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures this morning. And, and like I said to you earlier, I'm not really here to teach you anything brand new. Um, you, you know this already, that what I'm going to be sharing with you. But I really feel like God was leading me to bring this to you at the beginning of 2020 to remind you that there's nothing that he can't do. He really doesn't need our assistance to accomplish his will, but he wants to involve us in his work. Ryland asked for a, a scripture that I could put up there, and even though this, this time I'm going to have with you is not all based, well, I'm not going to be like preaching through Hebrews, but Hebrews 11.6 
says this, and this is kind of what everything I'm going to be talking about falls back on this this morning. To have faith in God is to trust him. Uh, So here we go. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So look at that very first part of Hebrews 11, 6 right there. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So God is saying this. The writer of Hebrews is saying this. If we are going to please God, we have to have faith in him. If we are going to please God, we have to trust in him. We have to trust in his purposes. We have to trust in his plan. What is God's purpose and what is he trying to accomplish here? We have to trust in the plan in which he's going to do that. And here's the tough part for us many many times. is not only do we have to trust that his plan is right and and we're going to do it, but we have to trust in the way in which he wants to accomplish it. Because if we'll trust in his plan, his purposes, his plans, and his ways, he gets the glory. Ultimately, what I'm asking you to consider this morning is whether you're going to uh, whether you're, you're going to live your life trusting yourself, trusting in your agenda and your plans, or can you begin to fully earnestly devote yourself and trust in God and his agenda and his plans. See, on the surface, it's really easy if I was to ask you, well, should you trust in your plans or should you trust in God's plan? And the church answer is this, well, we should trust in God's plan. It rolls off our tongue really easily. But how how come it's so difficult to live that out? And here's one more thing that we do. We'll begin to live our life And we'll drape this this curtain of spirituality over it. And we'll say, well, I'm going to go out and do this. And I'm going to ask God to bless this. And God had nothing to do with what you're about ready to go out and do. Because it's your agenda and it's your plan. And we'll drape the spirituality around it. And and we'll cover it. And and the others watching say, well, this must be a God thing because he just asked God to bless it. When in a sense, God had nothing to do with it because God wants the glory. This morning, as we consider our agenda and our plans versus God's agenda and God's plan, I'm going to ask you, I could give you like four little points real quick here to say, well, we should do this, this, and this. But let me kind of back up a little bit to paint a picture, a bigger picture, a God's perspective of this so that we're just not out doing something, but we know why we're doing what we're going to do. So let me ask you this question. Where is our focus when we're living our agenda or trusting ourselves versus where our focus is in trusting God in his agenda? Another way to ask this question is, who is getting the glory when we are self-centered versus when we're God-centered? You say, well, Matt, does God always have to get the glory? It always seems like it's about God, 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 and his glory. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. What does it mean to glorify God? You know, we say that, well, should God God get the glory? Well, what does that mean? One definition I dug up says this, glorifying God is to three different things here. Acknowledge his greatness, give him honor by praising him and worshiping him, and by, and by being in agreement with God, and that is borne out in our obedience to him. By, as we read his word and as we're agreeing with him, we're not only agreeing in our mind, but we're agreeing with him by in obedience and living it out. And we do this because he alone deserves our praise and our honor and our worship. God's glory is, is the essence of his nature, and we give glory to him by recognizing that, 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 that essence. So, Our agenda versus God's agenda. Who gets the glory? God needs to get the glory. And we know what glory is about praising and worshiping and honoring him and being in agreement and being obedient to him. So let me take one more step back to kind of give you this bigger picture before I give you some some points that you could write down and say, well, I need to do this, this, and this. Many of you have had an opportunity to take experiencing God, and there are seven realities in there. And, and let me share two of these realities and listen to a common word in these two realities. Reality number one is God is always at 
work around you. And reality number seven is this. You come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. You hear the word work in both of those realities. So if, that's, if his work is so important, what is his work? Well, his work is his mission, and his mission is seen in Habakkuk 2.14. Listen to this verse. This is so key. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of what? The glory of the Lord. As the water covers the sea, it gives you an example of that. But his mission is this. His work is this. This is what God wants to accomplish ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden, is for the, war, for the earth to be filled with the knowledge of his glory. In Philippians 2, 10 through 11, it says this. It says that, that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to what? To the glory of God the Father. So if God's mission is for the whole world to see his glory, then how will they see his glory through his creation? Well, the Bible talks about it time and time again. You look, the, the, the Psalms especially does this. It says you, know, you can't look at the, the moon, the stars, the heavens, the expanse out there. You can't live at, look at the living creatures without knowing there is something out there that created this. You look at his ultimate creation, which is us, and through us, God's glory could be seen. And we know this is true because in in Romans 1, Paul is telling them, here's one of the issues that we have is you're worshiping the wrong thing. You're worshiping the things that God created. Stop worshiping the physical things. Quit worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, the physical things. Those are nothing but idols. Worship the one who created those things. So who gets the glory when we're doing our agenda or God's agenda? God needs to be getting the glory. We know what glory is, and God's mission is for the earth to be filled with the knowledge of his glory. So does God give us any examples in his word that when we're not doing what he's asked us to do and the consequences that come from it? There's tons of examples. That's what I love about the Bible. When I'm sharing with people about who God and whose Christ is, and I point to the Bible they kind of, well, yeah, but that's what you believe. And I say, well, isn't it cool that in God's word that he shows us everything, the flaws of us all? I mean, even with King David, as perfect as we think he is, we know he was not perfect, it's, even though we put him up on this pedestal in Moses and Abraham. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at one instance that where it's God's agenda. Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them. And God said to this is in Genesis 1:28, be fruitful. Here's God's agenda to Adam and Eve: be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Jump to chapter two, verses 16 and 7. And God, then the Lord God commanded man, saying, "You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for in that day." If you eat it, you'll surely die. God's agenda. Adam and Eve, here's the deal. I've created this perfect place for you. You can have dominion over the, over the fish in the seas, over the birds in the sky, over the living animals. I've given you all these things to eat. Look at all these trees, everything. But just don't eat of this one tree. That's my agenda. This is what I'm asking you to do, to work it. Move one chapter down, Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you got to eat. You know, here we go. Our agenda. There's no, I mean, the tree, I know we're not supposed to eat of it, but why would there be such good fruit on it? And she said it was good for food, and it was a delight to her eyes. So here we are, emotionally driven. We physically need to eat, so why not? It looks good. It makes me feel good. Matter of fact, I may pick a whole basket of these so I can put them in my kitchen. And that the and to the light to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Well, I mean, here we go justifying. I mean, I go to school, so what? So I can become wiser. If I just eat of this apple. 
didn't the little serpent guy over here tell me if I eat this, I'll be just like God? Well, why wouldn't I want to do that? She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. God's agenda, our agenda. The result of our agenda, sin enters the world. You just go one more chapter. God says, bring an acceptable sacrifice. Abel brings the firstborn of the flock. God accepted it. Cain brings some fruit of the ground is what it says. God rejects it. Cain gets angry, murders his brother. You just jumped to numbers. I mean, I could go on and on. on. Numbers 28. The, 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 the stiff-necked Israelites are out in the wilderness. They're always griping. Why did we have to leave Egypt? And, and so this happened before where they needed water, and God told Moses what to do about striking the rock, and he did it. But here we are in Numbers 20, and they're grumbling about the same thing. Why did you lead us out here with no water? And this is God's agenda. He's looking at Moses and Aaron. He tells them this, my agenda, this is God, take the, sta- take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Two verses down in 10 and 11. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together. Hey, so far they're being obedient before the rock and said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we, me and Aaron, shall we bring water for for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock with his, uh, with his staff twice. And the water came out and abundantly the congregation drank and so did their livestock. If they had been obedient, water would have came out. Well, the same outcome happened. He just said we and struck it instead of telling it. But what was the result of them being doing their own agenda? Immediately, God told Moses and Aaron, because you were disobedient, you're not going to be able to enter the promised land. Again, I could go on and on. Jonah, God tells him, go, give a message of repentance. Jonah, you know, God, I know you, because we find this out later in Jonah, I know that you're merciful, and I know that you'll forgive them if they repent, and they're evil people. I want them to die. So I'm not going to deliver that message. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. God's agenda, I'm only asking to go deliver a message of repentance. They have the choice to repent or not. Jonah, I know better than you, God. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. He ends up in the belly of the fish. King Saul, how many times did he not do what he was supposed to do? I could go on and on with examples one after another. Here was the case. The focus was always on themselves, their accomplishments, accomplishments, confident in what they could do and why they do it. And why do we do it? We love to affirm ourselves. We're seeking acceptance in the world We're more concerned about being accepted in what our peers think about us than about what God thinks. Sometimes we're just over extreme control freaks and we can't let go. We believe there's nothing wrong with our way. We assume if the outcome is the same, what is the difference? And in that verse about where King Saul was not obedient And what God had told him to do about killing all the Amalekites and and all the animals. But he kept the king alive and he brought some of the livestock back with him. He disobeyed and Samuel told him, God desires obedience more than sacrifice. So here's my four points. If God is wanting us to to be obedient, what is he wanting us to be obedient to. Remember I was talking about how do we bring glory to God by worshiping him, by praising him, by being in agreement with his word and not just seeing it in our mind, but also doing it, being obedient. So that's what he wants. He wants us to be obedient to his commands, his statutes, his his, his precepts in his word. As we are reading through the Bible, we need to be obedient 
to what he says. And here's, let's see what the Bible says why we should. First point, when we obey God, it proves our love for God. When we obey God, it proves our love for God. I didn't make that up. 1 John 5, 2 through 3 says this, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? Obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Second point, when we obey God, it just demonstrates our faithfulness to him. 1 John 2, 3 through 6, And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We show our faithfulness to him when we obey his commandments. Thirdly, this is key, when we obey God, it glorifies him in the world. Didn't we talk about that a while ago when we begin to look at our agenda versus God's agenda? We begin to talk about God's glory and his work and what is his work. Well, his work is his mission. His mission is that throughout the whole world, throughout the, whole world the knowledge of his glory would be out there. So when we're obedient to God's word and the lost world is looking at us, he gets glorified. First Peter 2, 2 12 says this keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds, and here's the key, and glorify God on the day of visitation. So while we're living our life out there, whether it's in the workplace or the marketplace in our home or wherever it be to be, if we're being obedient to what God has called us to do, the lost world sees us. And God will get the glory because they're wondering, why are they living this kind of life? There's something different about them. Last point is this. When we obey God, we're blessed. This is Jesus speaking. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus had just washed the feet of the disciples, and he was making a point. Look, I just washed your feet, and you call me rabbi, you call me Lord. Go as I have done for you. Have that heart of humility and service and love, and do likewise. James says this in 1, 22, uh, 22 James said, if you are a doer of the word and not just a hearer, You'll be blessed. James is reminding us, and this is what Brian preached on several times in the past, was this. We can't just know it in our head, but we have to put it in action and live it out. We obey his commands, not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we, because we love him, we're enabled to obey his, we are able, enabled to obey his commands because once we believe in Christ, we're saved and we're remade. We know that we're new creatures in him. We don't have to create our own agenda. We just have to be open to the Holy Spirit to guide us. If I had time, I'd share with you this whole Macedonian call. But if you get a chance, go back and look at uh, Acts 15 and 16. Because the Apostle Paul even though he had his own agenda to go on a second mission, missionary journey, and he tells Barnabas, let's go back to all the churches that we started in the first one. And let's go back and strengthen those. That's discipleship. We live for Christ, love people, make disciples. That's what Paul was wanting to do. We planted these churches, Barnabas. Now let's go back and strengthen them. That was his agenda. That's a great agenda. But he hadn't got very far into it. He already met Timothy. He joined the team. And the Holy Spirit stopped him from going to Asia Minor. He couldn't go south because Barnabas and, and, and John Mark was down there. They already had that little blowout, and they went that way. They couldn't, they couldn't go east. They tried to go north. It says they tried to go up to Bithynia, which had been north. They couldn't. There was this one little trail they tried that they hadn't gone. And they got to Troyes, and they stopped there. And they go, well, what are we going to do now? We're at the edge of the sea. 
And they were trying to stay in, in, in this Asia Minor area, Galatia area. And Paul had a dream in the Macedonian call. And immediately the next day, Paul got up and said, let's go. We need to go to, basically, to Europe. They planted churches there, Philippi, Corinth, Thessalonica. We have five books of the Bible that we wouldn't have had if they hadn't gone there. Lots of things happened on that second missionary journey because Paul did not stick to his agenda of trying to retrace his steps from the first missionary journey, but because he was open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Here's our invitation. Right where you're at right now, what I want you to do is just close your eyes, and I want you to take a minute and just ask God, are there things in my life, are there plans that I have made Are there things that I have set up to do that I have not even come to you about? Am I living my agenda? Or, Lord, am I living your agenda? Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an attitude toward a family member. Maybe maybe it's an attitude toward the church. Maybe in your mind, you already have in your mind what our new pastor should look like and be like. Can we trust God that he can place on the heart of seven people that we have prayed over and commissioned to go find our new pastor? Can we trust God that he can lay the name of that person on their heart? And in his timing and only in his timing, bring him here. Or do we have our own agenda, even in that arena? There's so many different areas I want you to be praying over right now. But as Rylan uh, begins to lead us into some music, just set your agenda. Give it to God. If you need to come to the altar to do this, come up to the altar. Whatever you need to do, just give it to God. Let's stand together and let's sing this out, believing this for our church, for Central, that our God is not done. Come to the altar, pray, open your heart. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pull me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have said, this captive free and lord i can't help but see faithful you are Are yes and amen. 
All your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. Yes, you are. And all your promises are yes and amen. song together today as we declare that we are surrendering everything that we have, right? We're not going to be control freaks. We say, God, we're waving the white flag this morning. We surrender everything to you. We put it in your hands. We lay it at the foot of the cross and we lift high the name of Jesus.
So may that be the song of our lives as we leave this place. We go out into the mission field, being centered in Christ, being connected with people, right? Living for Him and Him alone. It's great to have you here at Central. It's been an awesome day in the house of the Lord. And we hope that if God has spoken to your heart today, you will not leave this place without responding. Our connection room is open. Stay, visit with each other. Thank you for, for being here at CBC. You are dismissed.